record this starting now. So uh, thanks for everyone for joining us. This is the Science of Turtles today. So um, if you haven't joined a Science of webinar before, um, thank you for joining us today. This is a really fun one because I love turtles and there's some really, really good and uh, cool information that we're going to talk about today. Um, if you have joined us before, thanks for joining us again, um, keeping this on in the series. Uh, this is halfway through, so we still have three more after this uh, today. And uh, my name is Monica McCubrey. I am the Wildlife Education Specialist for the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission here in the Lincoln office. And I'm going to really quick have my co-host um, introduce herself as well. Um, she's helping me out today. So Delaney, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Delaney Bruce. I am in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, and I am in a partnership position with Bird Conservancy of the Rockies and Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. And I will be helping moderate the chat. So if you have any questions, feel free to send them that way. And I'll either try to get them answered or we'll ask Monica when she has time. All right. Thanks, Delaney. Um, so yeah, like Delaney said, if you guys have any questions, please go ahead and put all of your questions or comments, good comments in the chat. Um, I do have everyone on mute today, uh, just so that everyone can hear clearly and that we don't have any issues. So um, the chat will be your best way to communicate. You can either send us a private message, either me or Delaney, and then when we have time, we will definitely answer them, or you can send them to the group. So odds are, if you have a question, someone else might have that very exact same question. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we're going to be talking about turtles here. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. <clears throat> and let me figure this out here. Um, and then for some reason, my computer is weird. So I always have to do it twice. All right. So hopefully everyone sees the big uh, version and not the presenter version. All right, perfect. So we're going to be talking about turtles today. Um, if you know me or know anything about me, I love reptiles. I'm always on the weird kid that likes reptiles. My mom's on today, so she can attest to that. Um, but we're going to talk about turtles today. So kind of the the other reptiles. So there's the, your crocodilians, your snakes, your lizards. And then turtles have always been kind of a weird, where do we place them in reptiles? So we're going to kind of figure that out today and then talk about also the turtles that we have here in Nebraska. All right. And if you're just joining us, remember um, to keep the conversation uh, topically relevant. So make sure it's something about turtles or animals or reptiles or Nebraska, something like that. Um, just letting you know, I've never had really an issue before. So, but just letting you know that if uh, things do get kind of out of hand or um, anything happens, we do have the right to remove you. Again, I'm not too worried about this today, but just kind of um, putting that in our disclaimer box as well. All right, so I do want to talk a little bit about introduction to turtles. What is a turtle? What do they look like? I know everyone, I'm sure, has seen a turtle before and knows what they are, but do you really know what a turtle is? So turtles are a very diverse group of reptiles. There's about 285 plus species of turtles in the world, um, and they inhabit very different areas. Everything from tropical rainforests to desert regions to America to um, the Americas or to um, the sea, like our sea turtles that we have. Um, people usually try to divide them into three different groups that marine, freshwater, and then our terrestrial species. So that's kind of a good way that people have always lumped them together. Um, each one of these turtles though is characterized by slow growth, they usually have a late maturity rate, so by the time that they are able to uh, reproduce, they're sometimes 30, 40 years old. Um, they're very late maturity as well, like we talked about. They have slow growth. They usually live a long time and they have repeated reproduction. Um, no other tetrapod has a shell like this turtle. Um, it, it completely encloses their pectoral girdle and their pelvic girdle. So pectoral meaning up here um, by your pec muscles and then your pelvic girdle that holds your legs and the rest of your trunk together. So we're going to go ahead and talk about um, how turtles kind of evolved and how they've adapted. So they've always been recognized as kind of a unique group of animals, not only because of their shell, but also because of their life history and their fossils. Um, 
if you ever remember back in school, Charles Linnaeus is kind of the one that started using scientific names and classifying animals that way. When he first did this, he characterized them um, 15 species into something that was called testudo. Um, so these were the turtles um, that he knew about and kind of the first ones that he wanted to divide them up as. Um, well, that was a long time ago. Um, things changed. In 1805, another person divided the turtles based on their habitat. So were they marine animals? He named those chelonias. Um, freshwater, which is going to be your emmys or your emmydidae, um, and then land animals, which was the testudo again. So he just divided them even, even further. Um, a year later, someone else constructed another pair, another listing, which is actually still used today, that chelis group, and we'll talk about those as well. So when we talk about turtles, um, and I didn't even know this, when we really divide turtles up, there's two big groups and it all goes about their neck. How flexible is their neck? What is the retraction pattern on their neck? How do they move their neck? Um, so there's two big different groups under this order testunidase or sometimes chelonia is what people use. Um, it splits then into two sub orders. The parodia one is the side neck turtles. So these guys are gonna be able to retract their neck and head um, by laying them to the side. Um, sometimes people call them snake neck turtles too, same thing. Um, so when you look at them, the sides of their neck and head are going to be exposed. And then there's a gap between the top part of their shell, which is called the carapace, and the plastron, which is the bottom part of their shell. So on the other half then, not the side neck turtles, there is called the hidden neck turtles. Um, so these guys are going to retract their neck into a special slot in the body cavity, and that will form a a vertical S shape um, when you look at them from the side. So really when you divide these two turtles up, um, they fit into two main categories and it all is based on how they leave or retract their neck. All right, <clears throat> so um, that was kind of like our beginning, like very, very broad overview of turtles. So now I'm going to go ahead and talk to you about um, some just kind of different vocabulary. A lot of people lump in turtles, tortoises, and terrapins together, the three T's. Um, they're very different. This is one thing that um, besides someone calling a snake poisonous, it's like right up there with like uh, nails on a chalkboard. So um, one time I saw this meme, and I'm sure some of you have seen it before. I think it's hilarious. Um, there was this recently my my six-year-old said to me, dad, those turtles are playing piggyback. I knew it was time to have the talk. Um, son, I said, those are tortoises, not turtles. So if you're not talking to your kids about this, um, who is? So there's a huge difference between turtles and tortoises and terrapins. So I want to make that distinction before we go on any further. All right, so turtles. Turtles are going to spend most of their time and their life in the water. Um, when you look at their feet, they're normally webbed. And then when you think about our sea turtles, then um, their back feet have actually formed into flippers so that they can move and uh, swim through the water very easily. Um, when you look at their shell, one of the characteristics of true turtles is that they are streamlined. So they're going to be a little bit more flat, like a pancake, um, than tortoises or terrapins. Um, these guys, um, like any other animal, any other turtle, they will leave the water to lay their eggs. They don't lay their water or their eggs in the water like an amphibian does. Um, and they bask in the sun to get warm. Uh, during the winter, they will brumate. Um, so they dig a hole. They sometimes find a crevice. Um, they will sleep underwater, which we'll talk about here later, until the spring comes. Um, normally, true turtles, and there's always exceptions, can usually be found in the continents of Africa, the Americas. Um, mostly that is their distribution. However, again, there are exceptions. Um, their shell is also very light in weight. It's not heavy. Um, and they're usually a little bit shorter lived than tortoises. So instead of living 100 years, they could live 50 or 60, 75 years. So again, not that short, um, but still shorter than tortoises. All right, so tortoises are very different. They spend most of their life on land. They don't have webbed feet, um, but again, basically what happens is their, their feet kind of look like little elephant feet. Um, they use them, they're round and stumpy. They use them to walk on land and to dig burrows. That is what they've adapted over time to do. They are very bad swimmers. They go in the water, they drink water. Sometimes they might like going in the water, but 
they're not good at it. Um, because of their small size and their slow movement, um, they don't eat a lot of things that move fast or quickly. They're not um, predators where they will chase after their food. So they eat things that are sedentary. Um, so like cactus and fruits and shrubs and plants. Um, normally they are very large. Um, some of the ones in the Galapagos, they can get up to 900 pounds. Uh, turtles just don't get that big. They're usually a smaller group of animals. Uh, tortoises are also mostly, they're going to be herbivores. Again, not all of them, but most of them are. They're usually longer lived than turtles and they're found in Asia, Africa, and there's even some in the um, Americas. If you guys know of the gopher tortoises that live in Florida, they're very neat to look at. So we have this weird middle ground then. We have something called a terrapin, which a lot of people are like, yeah, I've heard of them, but I don't really know what they are. So they're kind of a mix between a tortoise and a turtle. Um, so the name is actually given to them because they spend a little less time in the water than true turtles, but not enough time on land to be called tortoises. So again, they're that weird middle ground. Um, they usually live in what we call brackish water, which is a mix of salt and fresh water, like marshes and swampy areas. Um, <clears throat> they spend about half Half their life on land and half their life on water. Their shells are kind of a mix between a tortoise, a turtle, oh my gosh, turtle and a tortoise. Um, so a little dome shaped, a little more streamlined, um, and they are generally what we call omnivores. So they eat plant and insect material as well. All right, so just giving you a little kind of overview to start here. Um, I just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page when we talk about turtles, tortoises, terrapins. Um, are there any questions or anything that need to be answered? Um, someone I see asked, will this be recorded and posted on the Game of Parks Education YouTube page? Yes, it will. Um, probably give us till about tomorrow afternoon and it will be posted on our education page. And I can put that in the chat um, as well at the end. But do we have any other questions or anything like that before we move on? It looks like the other questions were answered. It was about the difference between a turtle and a terrapin. Perfect. Um, and then if there were alligator snapping turtles in Nebraska. Ooh, good question. So we don't have alligator snapping turtles. Um, they're a little bit more southern in the region of the United States. We do have what we call common snapping turtles too. A little bit smaller, um, but very similar to a, an alligator snapping turtle. Good questions. And then they are curious about the turtle behind you. Oh yes, can you see him? His name is Chomper. <clears throat> and I was actually gonna maybe get him out here in a little bit if we had time at the end. Um, so he's just a common snapping turtle. He's maybe about four years old and he's about the size of maybe a small saucer plate. All right. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about some features that tortoises and turtles have um, that kind of make them very unique and special. So obvious thing everyone knows about first is their shell. It's kind of this, everyone knows a tor turtle by their shell. Um, so what people usually don't realize is that their shell is a living tissue. It grows as the turtle grows. Um, so these big Galapagos tortoises, when they are born, they don't um, hatch out of an egg and they don't, they don't weigh 900 pounds. Um, they grow um, very slowly and they grow with their shell. Um, so in hard shells, um, like the ones that you see here, they're made of what we call beta keratin. And then in the soft shells, they don't have the beta keratin, but they have alpha keratin which is just a different type of protein. Um, if you're familiar with keratin, you can look on your fingernails because that is the same stuff that your fingernails are made out of, your hair is made out of, your toenails are made out of, a cow's horns are made out of that, a snake's, um, like a rattlesnake's rattle is made out of that. It's a very, very common thing in the animal um, world. It's used a lot. Um, so their shells then are gonna be covered with what we call scoots. Um, when you talk to herpetologists and they look at a, a turtle shell, they're gonna say, this is the rear anterior margin left five. Um, so all of those have scoots, they are roughly correspond to the bones and the body portions that they're named after. So this is the pectoral scoot left number five, so which means it's gonna be up by their chest. Um, so it's just a very easy way for scientists to say, okay, this is the one what we're looking at. This is the one we're talking about. Um, the don't, 
the scoots don't really um, overlap the bones. They're a little bit staggered. So that gives them really good hardness and that rigidity. Um, and then over time, they will be replaced just like your fingernails. You clip your nails, um, they will shed and, and molt their uh, scoots as well. We do have soft shell turtles um, in the world and in Nebraska, we have two of them. Um, so instead of having hard bony scoots, they, it is replaced by that leathery skin and it's very pliable and almost flexible. We'll talk about them a little bit later. All right, so when we're talking about a turtle shell, the top part is called the carapace. And basically what happened, it is the fusion of those trunk vertebrae and the ribs um, to overlay a set of those dermal bones. So that is the top portion of a shell. The bottom portion is called the plastron um, and that forms between the fusion of the sternum. So in your chest and your pectoral girdle with those external dermal bones. So I have a cross section here so you can kind of see. Um, I get a lot of people ask me, can turtles take their shells off? So contrary to popular belief, they cannot. Um, if something were to happen with their shells, um, if you know they get hit by a car or they get injured or a predator gets them some way and damages that shell, that's not good. Um, if, if it's a light damage, it just like your fingernails, they can repair itself after time. Um, but if it's a crack or if it's a heavy wound, they will not be able to do that. And it could severely hurt the, sh the, um, the turtle. Um, shells can be very different. They can be hard. They can be super dome shaped. They can be soft. Um, if you've ever looked at a snapping turtle, they have a very large carapace or that top portion of their shell, but then their plastron is really reduced. It's very small. It almost looks like just a T and that is all they have. So why or how did shells evolve over time? Um, so in 2008, research discovered a 220 year old million tur year old turtle shell. Um, and this like changed the game. Everything that scientists knew about turtles was thrown out the window because of this newly discovered um, old fossil of a turtle shell. Um, so basically what happened is that um, it changed how they believed that they evolved and why they evolved. Um, so over time, how did they evolve? The lower ribs basically became really wide and they fused together to form that bottom half of the shell or the plastron. Um, the upper ribs then fused and merged with the spine to make the top part of the shell. Um, so basically what happened is eventually the ribs started growing over the shoulder blades and this um, shell kind of formed over time. So why did turtles need to form a shell? Um, so basically their ribs and the muscles, when they breathe, it helps them um, the ribs and the muscles is what helps them um, inflate and deflate so that they can breathe. The shell actually compromises their breathing. So some of you are probably like, okay, then why did they evolve this shell if it hurts their breathing? Well, it gets better. Um, the shell also makes them slower. So with these fused ribs, it prevented the reptile from moving its entire trunk. So turtles rely on their only their legs to move. Um, if you've ever watched a Komodo dragon or a lizard move, they move move with their whole body, their whole trunk, kind of like a dinosaur. Um, turtles don't do that. They use their legs only. So not only did the shell um, compromise their breathing and it also made them slower, um, they still made the shell and decided for some reason this was a good idea. Um, the widening of the ribs then became because they were anchored the front legs um, because they, scientists believe that this helped them um, excavate. So basically the whole shell was made so that turtles could dig and they could excavate. Um, this basically helped them become a burrowing specialist. Um, so when we look at turtles and tortoises, they have those long claws, um, they have the stumpy legs, they have a lot of muscle in the front so that they can excavate and dig. Um, so once those ribs are freed from the constraints, they could be then selected for a shell. And that is how that shell was made. Um, so a great example of a turtle shell is what we call an exaptation. Um, so this basically means that the, um, it was, it was made to form one function and then over time it co-opted to serve another function. Um, another great example is, uh, bird feathers. So, um, when reptiles and um, birds started having feathers, it wasn't so that they could fly. Um, it was basically to keep them warm or to signal mates and other rivals. Over time, they adapted to using those feathers to fly. And so this is another reason the tortoise shell, the turtle shell, it was made so that they could dig. And then over time, it became a protection agent. It helps them, them survive and helps them protect themselves. And now they do both. Um, 
So um, someone, I found this quote and I really liked it. It says, a change in the structure of the body can only provide a selective advantage based on its current abilities. So there was no way that turtles could have understood that their shell was gonna help them um, escape predators and help them survive. Um, basically what it was supposed to do was supposed to help them dig. And then over time it, it changed and then evolved into two functions. So that's why they have a shell. So when we look at turtle size, there's no good, they're usually about this size. Um, it depends on what you're talking about. Are you talking about a sea turtle, um, like our leatherback sea turtles? Um, we again, don't have them in Nebraska. Um, we have soft shell turtles, which sometimes people get confused of. Um, the leatherback sea turtles um, live in the oceans and they can get anywhere between 600 and 1500 pounds. They can get anywhere from four and a half to five uh, and a quarter feet long. Um, you never really realize how large these turtles are until you Google a picture of them and see someone sitting next to them. If you're thinking about a four and a half to a five foot long turtle weighing 1500 pounds, this is a huge animal. People don't understand how large they can get. Um, the largest land turtle, um, we call that a, the, Gal the Galapagos tortoise. Um, they get up to six feet long. They can weigh up to 900 pounds. If you're looking at a freshwater turtle, the alligator snapping turtle, which I know someone mentioned earlier, they can get about two and a half feet long and weigh about 200 pounds. Um, the Yank softshell turtle, they can get about three and a half feet across and weigh 300 pounds, so a softshell turtle. And then you have everything from this tiny little speckled cape tortoise, which is about three inches long and only weighs about five ounces. So very, very small. If you go from that to like the 1500 pound leatherback, there's a huge diverse diversity in size. All right, something else I wanna to talk to you about today is their tomia, or sometimes people call them their bird beaks. Um, so reptiles and birds are very closely related. They share some characteristics. Um, turtles also don't have teeth. No um, living or existing turtles have teeth. Instead, they have these things called tomias or beaks. Um, so the, basically the upper jaws and the lower jaws, they formed this um, keratinized sheath um, that fits into their skull, similar to like false teeth. Um, they're sharp and they allow the turtle to break off pieces of flesh or to kill um, small prey really quickly, like a snail or a cricket or something like that. Um, they don't chew, so they swallow whole, they rip it off and swallow it whole. Um, and just like your fingernails, this tomia is constantly growing over time. Um, and just like your nails and just like their scoots on their shell, it sheds as well, um, but it sheds in very small pieces at once. All right, how do turtles breathe? So they spend a lot of time underwater and underground. Um, so all turtles will use um, to breathe air and they must surface um, at some time to refill their lungs. So some turtles can stay underwater for hours, um, sometimes even months if they're hibernating um, or bromating, but at some point they do have to come up and get air. Um, so very similar to how a fish uses their gills, they will take up dissolved oxygen through the water using something called their papillae. Um, so the shells actually can't expand. We talked this about earlier. It's the ribs and the muscles that expand underneath. Um, so what they have is they will move air in and out of the lungs through those rib muscles and the contraction of the, um, the other muscles around those. So their shell actually can't expand. And turtles do not have diaphragms, which is kind of interesting. So they really have to work hard. Um, sometimes people turn turtles upside down. This can actually be very dangerous for them because if you think about it, all of their organs are being pressed down to their head. Um, basically, they're, they're suffocating. If they're under there for hours or days, <clears throat> they're not going to be able to get enough um, contraction of their muscles to breathe. Um, so that's why if you ever see a turtle, kindly turn it over if you can. Um, uh, that's just how they breathe. So they can sometimes get squished if they're upside down for too long. So something else I want to talk about is buccal pumping. If you ever looked at like an aquatic turtle, you might notice their chin is going up and down, very similar to how a frog does it. Um, here, the animal will move the floor of its mouth um, that inflates the lungs. So very similar to like a frog that you see. Um, frogs will do this too. Um, salamanders do it. Uh, turtles will do it. And they have uh, specialized cells in their cloaca, which is also called their vent, which is also unscientifically, their butt, um, but their cloacal um, bursae is what actually contracts the oxygen from the water. So turtles breathe through their butts. 
Um, Delaney and I were actually just talking about this before everyone logged on, but it's kind of a cool turtle superpower like Delaney mentioned. So very, very interesting. So one thing I do want to talk about is brumation. So when they go to sleep for the winter time, this is how they breathe underwater under the ice. So this picture was caught um, a couple weeks ago by someone in Nebraska and then um, Game of Parks asked to use the photo. So um, they use cloacal respiration. So these are two snapping turtles underneath the ice in Nebraska. So how are they surviving underneath the ice for months at a time? Basically they're breathing through their butts. So the colder the water, the slower the turtles metabolism. So during the winter they need less oxygen and less energy because they're not moving around very much. Um, so when they brumate, they will store the energy and oxygen from the water um, wherever they are. So if it's a lake or a pond, um, and they'll push the oxygen across their body with high areas of uh, blood vessels. So those one of those high concentration areas is their cloaca or their butt. Um, so that is how they breathe. They, they use their butt, which is really neat. No other animals I know do that. All right. <clears throat> so now that we've talked about like butt breathing and all these really cool things, does anyone have any questions? We do have a couple questions. Cindy is asking, um, do the babies breathe underground since they do come up from the sand to travel to the water? Uh, yes, it kind of depends on the species of turtles. Um, some turtles will go out right away. Um, one of the ones that do not actually are um, painted turtles, I believe, and I think box turtles as well. Um, so right away when they're born, they will actually dig underneath the surface um, to stay there and then come up the next following spring. So yes, they will do that as well. They will breathe underground as well. And then we have another question from Ethan about what was the popular belief before scientists discovered the myofossil? Yeah, so um, before scientists found this 20 or 2008, they found this uh, 200 year old fossil, 200 million year old fossil. They strictly believed that turtle shells were evolved so that they can, pr for protection. Um, so yes, that's part of it, but now they kind of figured out this, uh, the first part of that story that yes, they were excavators, they were diggers, they really were specialized in that digging per se. And then following that, um, it just kind of happened that the turtle shells then um, were able to use them for protection as well. So good question. And then another one we had earlier was what it would be the best way to help turtles if we found them on the highway. Yeah, so um, first first thing we always want to tell people is make sure that you are safe too. So um, don't stop your car in the middle of a highway. Um, you know, make sure that no one's behind you, pull off to the side, um, look both ways before you cross the road. Um, and we always tell people if you can, make sure you put turtles in the direction that they were traveling. Don't turn them around because they're gonna turn right back around and go the other way. So just kind of help them out across the road if you can. Um, but again, your safety is one of the most important things as well too, so. All right. All right, we'll go ahead and talk a little bit about habits here. All right, so when we talk about turtles being hunters, we know that they're slow, so they're probably not going to like cheetah speed chase their way down um, some food. So there's a couple of different ways that they can do this and catch their prey. Um, <clears throat> most of the time, um, they don't have the speed like we talked about. So they will feed on vegetation or things that really don't move very quickly, like earthworms, mollusks, insect larvae, that kind of stuff, things that they can easily grab. Um, most of the omnivorous turtles, so turtles that eat plant and animal material, um, they change their diet with age. Um, so a lot of juveniles um, to get protein in their body um, and to get all their organs and their shell growing and everything, they're going to be more insectivorous. Um, so they're going to be eating a lot more insects or small vertebrates or insect larvae, that kind of stuff. As they get older, they will either develop a strict specialized diet, like some turtles only eat mollusks, some turtles will only eat snails, um, and, but then they will also become a little bit more herbivorous. So they'll eat more vegetation, fruits, vegetables, shrubs, that kind of thing. And that's very true with uh, snapping turtles too. All right, um, so how do they hunt? There are some ambush predators. Um, they usually have some cryptic colorations or shapes um, and they have that long muscular neck like a snapping turtle. Um, when I say they have a long neck, um, they have a long neck. Um, it really comes out and a lot of the times when I've done classroom presentations, that's one of the things that kids always comment about, wow, look how long their neck is. You never really think of a turtle having a long neck until it reaches out and grabs their food. Um, alligator snapping turtles, we don't have them in Nebraska, but they have a very cool um, 
tongue. It almost, when they uh, sit in the water, they have their mouth open and their tongue actually looks like a little worm. So fish will come inside their mouth thinking, I'm gonna eat this worm. And then that is when they snap down and grab that food. Um, one of the things that uh, we don't have this turtle in Nebraska, it's called the Mata Mata. Um, you might've heard of it. Um, it's kind of a weird looking thing. It's on this picture right here. Um, they use this gape and suck technique. Um, so basically they will create this uh, area. They open their mouth and they create an area of low pressure that basically sucks in everything and it goes down their gullet and then they flood out the water that they don't want to eat and swallow. Um, so the Mata Mata does three different things. They do that gape and suck technique. They are also ambush predators. And one of the things that they do is they have all those little spines and they almost look like a leaf in the front of their head. They're uh, sensories. So they're really bad eyesight. They can't see really at all. So they use those to be able to sense uh, vibrations and movements in the water so that they can find their prey. All right, uh, another question I always get is, how do you tell a male turtle from a female turtle? It kind of depends. Um, it's often really difficult to sex a turtle. Um, <clears throat> males usually have a longer, thicker tail. Again, this is all usually this happens, but again, there's always an exception. Um, the vent is usually farther back as well. So if you look at this picture here, there's four different sections. If you look at the top right one, you can see the tail is going to be longer in the male. And it's also going to have the vent or that cloaca is going to be outside of their shell line. Usually females are a little bit smaller and stubbier and their vent is going to be within their shell line. Um, males are usually smaller, like with most reptiles. Uh, females have to hold eggs and carry eggs. But again, not all species have this. Um, box turtles are pretty easy because they have different colored eyes. Um, male turtles will usually have um, bright red, kind of orangish colored eyes. Females are going to have that green or sometimes yellow eyes. So that's a very easy way. Um, and then sometimes in some turtles, uh, when they go to breed, they will get very bright colors as well. Um, in things like our sliders and our northern painted turtles, um, pond turtles, a great way to tell um, males are going to usually have longer claws. This is what they use to tickle the female um, and to get her to breed. And females usually have smaller claws because they just don't simply need to attract a mate. They're the ones that are getting per Pursued. All right, so nesting. So all species of turtles, no matter what they are, if it's a sea turtle, if it's a matamata, mata, if it's a snapping turtle, they come to the land to lay their eggs. Um, mostly this is seasonal and annual. Um, so it's a certain time during the year and they do it every year. But again, not all things follow those laws. So females usually don't lay eggs every year. Some of them do, some of them don't. Um, many species can actually store sperm um, for many years. So this means that in the same clutch, one female, there might be six different dads. Um, so looking at DNA testing and things like that, they've discovered that certain species can actually store that sperm and then use it for years. So they don't have to mate annually especially if it's a harsh year, if there's not a lot of water, not a lot of food, and they just simply can't do it, this is a good advantage for them. Um, and then some species of sea turtles um, and other turtles will make really long migrations. Um, but again, some don't. It just kind of depends on the species. What do their eggs look like? So there's two shapes, um, pond turtles, river turtles, wood turtles, musk turtles. They're going to have elongated eggs. Sea turtles, soft shells, and snapping turtles, they're going to look more like ping pong balls. Um, Depends on, again, the species, but some of them are going to be brittle, some of them are going to be leathery um, and almost wet in appearance. Um, it just depends. Soft shells and mud turtles are going to lay really brittle eggs. Um, snapping turtles, sea turtles are going to have really leathery eggs. So the shape and the texture of them. All right, so what do baby turtles look like? Um, this was taken in Nebraska. This is a tiny little painted turtle. So if you know what a, about the size of a beer cap bottle, um, this is the size of little baby turtle. So very, very small. Again, their shell grows as they do. Um, in most turtles, the temperature is gonna depend on the sex of the babies. Um, again, not every species. Uh, for instance, like soft shell turtles, it's all genetics, not temperature, um, but we do call it temperature sex determination. Uh, sea turtles are a great example of this. It kind of depends on the warmth of them. There's two different types. If they're um, on the bottom or the top of the nest, they're going to be a little colder, a little warmer. If they're in a certain range, it's going to be a male. If they're extremes, it's going to be a female. Um, it kind of depends. So <clears throat> it's a total mystery for scientists. Um, they have no idea why 
they do this. They don't know the advantage of this. Um, this is still kind of a weird mystery that scientists are trying to figure out. Um, sometimes babies, they will use a very small egg tooth to break out of that shell. And then some babies, I know someone asked this earlier, they will stay in the nest. Um, some of them, the box turtles, uh, when they hatch, they're going to immediately dig down in that soil and stay there until the following spring when they come out. Um, it just depends on the species and when their uh, nesting period is. So some come out right away, some stay there and come out in the springtime. All right, so that was a lot of information on turtles. There's a lot that I'm not covering too, but again, giving our time, I'm going to make sure that we um, we cover as much as we can. And so now I kind of want to talk to you about um, what turtles we have in Nebraska, because I know that's always a question that a lot of people have. What do we have in Nebraska? What's cool about them? What do they look like? That kind of stuff. So do we have any questions before we kind of move on to the last part of our program here? Sue did have a question about any threatened or endangered species of turtles in Nebraska. That is a good question. Um, so we don't necessarily have a listed threatened and endangered species. We have two species that we call um, in need of conservation, and we're going to talk about them here in a little bit. Um, but uh, otherwise, there's none in Nebraska that are labeled as threatened or endangered. Good question. And then there, another question just popped up. Do turtles make noise? Yes, they do make noise. Um, a lot of it's going to be when they're breeding um, or when they're attracting a mate. Um, some turtles will bark um, like a dog. Some turtles make low grunts and hissing noises. Um, if you've ever touched a turtle, especially like a box turtle, uh, sometimes when they go into their shell, they make like a noise. It's kind of like them expelling air out of their mouth as fast as they can. Um, so yes, they do make noises. Um, I would highly encourage anyone that's interested to go to like YouTube or something like that and just kind of look for turtle noises and see what they sound like because it's very interesting. I will tell you that. Then we had just one more question about do some turtles carry the Staminilla bacteria? Good question. They absolutely can. Um, animals can. We always tell people, you know, wash your hands after you touch these animals. Um, it kind of depends on where you're finding these animals. So um, if you're in an area with lots of geese and lots of goose poop, um, often, yes, they can carry salmonella. Um, I have touched a lot of wild turtles and I've never gotten salmonella before. Um, so we always do tell people, you know, be safe, be cautious, wash your hands, that kind of thing. But um, it does happen, but not very often. All right. All right. So I want to make sure that we finish this and then we can certainly uh, get back to questions as well. So Nebraska has nine different types of turtles. So we're going to go through them just really quickly. Um, I have some great photos from Dan Fogel, um, who was nice enough to provide them so you can get a good image of what they look like. So common snapping turtle. This is our largest turtle that we have in Nebraska. Um, they can get 15 inches or more long, weigh 50 or plus more pounds. Um, they're found just about anywhere, um, lakes, reservoirs, um, watersheds, that kind of thing. Um, they, these guys will use that sit and wait strategy. So they get their name snapping turtle because they will sit there with their mouth open, waiting for something to pass by and then use their long neck and grab it. Um, oftentimes people think of them as very aggressive turtles, which they often are compared to things like a painted turtle, um, especially on land. Um, if you think about it, that is not their comfort zone. This is them trying to get somewhere else. This is them becoming very vulnerable. So they don't like being in that area. So that's probably why they might be a little bit more aggressive um, if they're on land rather than the water. Uh, females will nest in May and June. And a lot of times people will um, take cool videos and get really good photos, you will see little hatchlings coming out at about August through October. So um, it's kind of always neat to see those little ping pong ball shaped uh, eggs somewhere around Nebraska. All right, so another really common turtle we have in Nebraska, this is our northern painted turtle. Um, this is your most commonly seen turtle if you're fishing or if you're out hiking and you're by a water pond. These are the ones that you see usually up on the logs basking. There's usually like five or six of them at a time. Um, they get their name because when you look at the plastron or the bottom of their shell, it's really pretty. They have um, very pretty colors and it's kind of painted. It's kind of a red, yellow, orangey color. Um, these guys can pretty much be anywhere as long as they're water. Um, 
but they do prefer kind of permanent ponds. That way they don't have to travel if that road ditch or if that pond or wetland would dry up for the season. Um, these guys are active a little bit earlier than most of the other turtles. They come out in about March, depending on the weather. Um, if we have a really warm uh, season, they might be coming out a little earlier. If it's a little typically colder than normal, they might wait a little longer. Um, these guys, the young will hatch in the fall. And then these are ones that actually overwinter as babies. So they do not leave the nest until the following springtime. And then they will come out uh, when the weather warms up. All right, so someone asked if we had um, some threatened endangered species. This is about as close as it gets. Um, this is a species, the Blandings turtle. It is considered a species in need of conservation, but it is not a federally or state listed threatened endangered species. Um, Nebraska is actually pretty lucky because even though we call them a species in need of conservation, Nebraska actually has a pretty good population of Blandings turtles um, compared to our neighboring states like Minnesota, Wisconsin, um, Kansas, any of those places, they are considered threatened and endangered species in some of those states. We're pretty lucky. We have a fairly good population of them. Um, these guys are pretty easy to identify. They get fairly large and their most cool identifying feature is their bright yellow chin. It's always a bright highlighter yellow, easy to recognize. They're mostly aquatic, um, but in the summer you will sometimes see them pretty far from water traveling on a road or um, on a bank or something like that. Um, they will nest from about May to June and um, they will lay elongated eggs. And these guys are gonna have really leathery shells on them. All right, um, a turtle that most people have never heard of is called the false map turtle. Um, these guys are gonna be river dwelling turtles. And I know it's not a good picture, but their back feet are very large, almost like paddles, like a, almost like a sea turtle. Um, they like streams and backwaters associated with rivers, but they need an area that has lots of rocks and fallen logs so that they can bask on them. Um, females will lay multiple clutches through May and July. These guys will lay oval shaped <clears throat> eggs. Um, and just like snapping turtles, they hatch at about August. Um, this is another species in Nebraska. This is the species in need of conservation. So we have a false map turtle, and then there is a Mississippi map turtle, very, very similar to this one. Um, there's one little difference with the way that the yellow is on their, their eyes or behind their head. Um, sometimes both have been found here in Nebraska. Um, if you do find a Mississippi map turtle, um, let somebody know because that is something that we would love to know for data. Um, they kind of are live more in the Missouri downstream um, in Iowa and Missouri. We've seen a few come up to Nebraska, but not a ton. So we always are on the lookout for those. All right, here's your weird one. Out of all the turtles, this is more of a more closely related to a tortoise than it is a turtle. Um, this is our only native terrestrial turtle that we have. This is our box turtle. Um, these guys will have a single hinge on them. So what that means is that they can pull their arms, their legs, their feet, everything into their shell and almost completely enclose it like a box. That is how they protect themselves. Um, males are gonna be more brightly colored than the females. Um, if you're wondering, this photo that I have here, this is a female turtle. Um, females are a little bit more yellow. And if you look closely at her eyes, they are yellow as well. Males are gonna have those reddish orange eyes and they're gonna have a little bit more reddy orange colors on their, um, their legs. These guys are found mostly in Western Nebraska. They're omnivorous. They eat things like succulents, arthropods, worms. Um, the ones in our office, we will actually feed them baby mice and they love them. So they're not opposed to eating small vertebrates as well. Again, something that is pretty sedentary. They can't move very fast. Uh, females will lay their eggs and then again, retain that sperm for the following year. All right, red-eared slider. Um, if you go to any pet shop, this is the turtle that you're gonna see. Um, they are only occurring natively mind you, natively, in one county in Nebraska, Richardson County. Um, but people see them all the time because a lot of people get them as pets and then they either decide they don't want them anymore um, or they get too big or they don't want to care for them. So they release them into ponds, local ponds, lakes. Um, so you might see a lot of them a lot of places, but natively in Nebraska, they only occur in Richardson County. Um, they have long claws. Um, we talked about this earlier. The males will have the very long claws that they will use in courtship rituals, um, which is kind of neat for them. These guys, again, pretty much anywhere with lots of aquatic vegetation, ponds, lakes, um, 
rivers too as well. Um, they breed in late May and they go through early June. All right, another turtle that most people don't know we have in Nebraska is called the yellow mud turtle. This turtle is neat because it's the only turtle in Nebraska that has two hinges in its shell. Um, they're found in short and mixed grass prairies, so more out in western Nebraska. And they are the only turtle in the world that will nest completely underground. Um, so again, only species in the world that does this. Their eggs are elliptical and they're gonna be very hard and brittle-like. Uh, these turtles are also mostly carnivorous a lot of other turtles are going to be omnivorous. These guys like snails, crustaceans, they'll eat live frogs, tadpoles, fish, carrion. Um, the main predator for these guys um, is my favorite Nebraska snake. The western hognose are going to be the main predator for all the hatchling little yellow mud turtles out there. So um, one reptile eating another. All right, our soft shells are two other weird turtles that we have. Um, this one is a little bit more specified and specific than the um, spiny soft shell turtle. This one likes river areas and it hardly ever leaves the water except to look for a nesting site. Um, females will lay oval or kind of roundish eggs that are very brittle. Um, these guys do not have that temperature sex determination. It's all determined by genetics. They mainly feed on invertebrates. Um, they really like large rivers. They don't like the little tributaries and the other things that come off of them. They're more of a large river species. Um, you can find them mostly in the Missouri River, but they have been found in the Platte, Elkhorn, and Big Blue as well. Um, this one and the next one, I'm gonna show you, they look very similar. Um, usually they aren't this brightly colored with each other when you look at them. Obviously these are two very easy turtles to distinguish between each other. Sometimes they don't look like this though. Um, one of the best ways to tell a spiny versus a smooth soft shell turtle is when you look at their nasal, if you look basically up their nose, the spiny soft shell will have two little kind of projections sticking out from the inside of its nose. Um, if you are able to get that close and they hold still um, and you can tell, good for you. These guys have extremely long necks and they're extremely aggressive biters, I will tell you. Um, I'm probably more scared of these guys than the snapping turtles just because um, they're cute and they look like they can't hurt you, but their, their legs and their, um, their uh, neck's pretty long. So just be careful with that. Uh, these guys, um, they're a little bit more um, not as specific when it comes to habitat. They like the little tributaries. They can be found in ponds, marshes, reservoirs. Um, they're mostly carnivores um, and they will feed on those insects. And these guys are found statewide, um, not just in Missouri, but they can be found all the way through Western Nebraska as well. All right, so that is all that I have. I will ask for questions here, but I don't wanna to forget to um, mention this for those of you that might need to log off. Um, please join us next week, uh, Thursday. We're already into February, February 4th um, for mosses and lichens. I guarantee that you will lichen this episode. Um, bad joke, but please come back. Um, <clears throat> the information will be better than the jokes, I promise. Um, we're gonna talk about lichens and mosses and things that people might not um, talk about or look at very much. We're going to make you stop and look at them next time. So join us same time Thursday, three o'clock PM central standard time. There is a different link and make sure that you register on zoom um, for a separate uh, webinar as well. Like I said, we are halfway through. Um, we have three more. So mosses and lichens, threatened and endangered species. And then our last one on February 18th, we're going to be doing the science of wetlands. Um, we're going to have Ted LaGrange, who is our wetland biologist here at Game of Parks, join us, as well as Grace Gard, who is our aquatic um, education specialist. Her and uh, Ted are going to be doing a lot of the talking. They are our wetland experts. So you won't have to listen to me much on that one. All right, so thanks everyone. We will talk about questions here, um, but make sure you join us next week for mosses and lichens. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen, um, but I would love to know if you guys have any questions or comments about turtles. I hope that you learned a lot about turtles. Um, definitely the coolest thing. I always love to tell people this, that they breathe through their butts. It's, it's just a cool superpower that they have and their shells are really neat. And just the way that they move is different than any other reptile. So, um, yeah. So does anyone have any questions? There was one question by Sue of what turtle species live in Salt Creek? In Salt Creek, um, I mean, you might find a northern painted turtle, you might find a red-eared spider that someone has 
released as a pet. Um, snapping turtles are probably pretty common as well. Um, you might find, maybe, you might find a very small, like a spiny soft shell um, sometimes. It, it just kind of depends. Yeah, it's not an ideal place to live, but it is a habitat. We have another one from Cynthia. Are, are, are hard shell turtles born with hard shells or do they harden at a certain age? Ooh, that is a very good question. Um, most turtles are born with hard shells. So um, they might be a little wet when they come out, but they're not at all like the leathery turtles, like the soft shells. They're gonna come out hard like your fingernails. Just think of a baby, um, when they're born, their nails are hard um, and and they continue to grow with, with, the, with the baby as well. So good question. There was another question about your turtle and if we could see. Okay. Another one, do, do turtles like other reptiles stop eating before brumating? Oh yeah, uh, good question, Mary. So sometimes uh, what they will do is they're not like other animals where they will um, store up a lot of fat for the winter time. They kind of just go about their day and, and just know that winter is coming. So they start going back to where they might want to brumate and find an area for the, the rest of the season to sleep. So um, kind of yes they they eat normally and then okay i notice it's getting a little bit lighter or darker earlier the temperature is changing the photo period is a little bit different so they start then going somewhere else and um to find for hibernating or brumating um someone i see asked what do the soft shells feel like um is this an example of that alpha carotene yes um so um, it just, it kind of feels like a very stiff leather. Um, if you've ever touched like a shark um, in a touch tank or something like that, minus the really rough feeling, that's what it feels like. It's very leatherly, it leatherly, leatherly. It is pliable. Um, it, it just, it's very flexible. Um, I'm, best way to describe it if you've never touched it. It's just that leathery feeling. It's wet. Um, it just feels more like harder skin than it does like a bone, like a normal turtle shell. Um, were any of the Nebraska turtles ever endangered? Not that I am aware. Um, just maybe they have been in that species in need of conservation, um, but no turtle as far as I'm aware has ever been on the endangered state or threatened or federal list as well. Um, how big would a painted turtle be at one year? It, it all depends um, <clears throat> if they eat a lot, if they have um, you know, the right temperature, they're protected, there's no predators chasing them. They could get um, maybe about the size of like a half dollar, a little bit smaller, a little bit bigger. Um, you know, If it's been a hard year, there's not a lot of water, they can't eat a lot of food or good quality food, they might be a little smaller. It just kind of depends on what their habitat is like or what their environment is like. Um, best place to see turtles in Omaha, literally anywhere where there's water, um, pond, lake, Missouri River, um, really anywhere, even sometimes roadside ditches, snapping turtles will stay there for a while if it's um, a hard year or if the, the water's there, they'll be there. Um, <clears throat> do snapping turtles attack or bite you when you're in the water? I mean, they can if your toes look like a good fish or something like that. I mean, I wouldn't stick my hand in a pond. Um, and, and try to get them to bite me. Um, again, this looks very similar to a worm in the water to a turtle, um, so I wouldn't take my chances. Um, where can I go to see turtles in Lincoln? Again, anywhere. Pioneers Park is really good. Um, Salt Creek has them. Uh, Beale Slough, I've seen snapping turtles. I live over kind of my tier park and I know I've seen snapping turtles and painted turtles there before. Um, rivers, ponds, lakes. Um, this little guy actually was found in a uh, apartment parking lot at like 84th and Highway 2. So somewhere, some snapping turtle laid eggs over there and that's where he was found. So pretty much anywhere. Um, I am not a herpetologist. I would love to be a herpetologist someday. Um, if you ever want to talk to two great herpetologists here in Nebraska, Dan Fogel, who works at Southeast Community College, and Dennis Ferraro is the herpetologist for the university. Two very good resources if you're ever interested in those as well. Um, can you talk about how their shells grow as they get bigger? Um, are, you, are you talking about 
just how they grow. It's just, it's very similar to your fingernail. So I have a, a girl, a daughter who's going to be two, her nails are very small. So just as you grow, the more protein, the more food you eat, um, the, the bigger you grow, it's going to grow with you. Um, Uh, sorry, I'm just reading this. I'm under the impression that if a turtle is removed from its environment and later released, unless it's returned to its original environment, it becomes disoriented and eventually dies. It just depends on how long the turtle is out of its original environment. Um, this guy has been out of his, the wild for six years now. Um, he could probably survive on his own, actually. Um, he has not been raised over generations and generations to do that. If you go by a like a tortoise at Petco or something like that, and then try to release it into the environment. One, Nebraska is not the right place to do that. And two, don't release turtles. Um, and three, um, they just have never been in the wild. And they've been so completely removed after generations and generations that they probably wouldn't be able to survive. Um, my son would like to know if turtle eggs are similar to chicken eggs. Is there a yolk or something in there to protect them? Yes, um, very similar. All eggs are pretty much kind of the same. And I am doing a science of eggs, I think, maybe next series or then one after that. Sometime this year, there's a science of eggs coming up and we'll talk all about that to so make sure everyone joins back in. Um, there has to be something in there for the animal to eat on um, and to even to serve. Some animals will have that to survive even after they hatch. So right now we have trout in our um, classroom behind us here. And um, they have the little egg sacs and they will actually eat off their egg sacs for about a week or two weeks, even after they hatch. So they're attached to them. Um, uh, any other false map turtles? Are they being spotted on the Eastern part of the state or could new random spottings be a result of released pets? For false map turtles, not many people won't even know about them and probably don't have them as pets. Um, so my guess is that the ones that are on the eastern part of the state, um, especially those Mississippi map turtles, they're just simply moving to a new area, especially from like the Missouri um, area down up the Missouri to Nebraska. So again, it's right kind of at that Brownville um, uh, border there right by Nebraska, Missouri that in Iowa that you're going to see those again, not very many of that we have seen, but they do happen. All right. Um, I want to make sure that we get this kind of recording done here. So if anyone does have any other questions, I'm going to go ahead and put my email in the chat for all of you. Um, again, Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, if you are interested in looking at this again or sharing this video with a friend, we are gonna go ahead and put it on our uh, Nebraska, I'll type this in the chat here, Nebraska Game and Parks Education YouTube channel. It's a mouthful. Um, but if you just go to YouTube and search bar Nebraska Game and Parks Education, um, it will come up and there's a link that says playlists. Go ahead and click playlists and search science of, and you can find the other two that we've done this year and then all the other ones that were done in 2020 as well. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and um, let you guys go. I'm so glad that you were interested in turtles. Thank you so much for the good questions. And remember to join us next week, Thursday, 3 o'clock p.m. for mosses and lichens. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.